Okay, uh, good morning everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, this is the second in a series of, uh, of conferences that I've been organizing with Mr. Nicolas Lavra and others on uh, constitutions for Europe and new European states. We are not under the auspices of any government, we are simply working as uh, academics to uh, try to provide ideas and, uh, and, uh, and structures to the, some of the states which could uh, either are now or, uh, or may be planning a referendum in Europe in the near future, uh, and in and so uh, we and and uh, and so and then also to also suggest uh, possible ways of uh, reforming the European Union that might help to alleviate some of the controversy and uh, make the make the arrangements more suitable uh, for the for the member states given the the state of uh, turmoil. Uh, uh, that, that the European Union finds itself in at this point. Uh, so for today, I want to introduce myself, uh, Mark McNaught. I'm a uh, professor. Uh, I'm an associate professor of uh, English at the University of uh, Rennes. Uh, today, we will be hearing also from Nicolas Levra, who is the head of global studies at the uh, at the University of Geneva. We will also be hearing from David Edward, uh, professor emeritus at the University of Edinburgh and former EU judge. Uh, uh, and also Brent Lloyd, a uh, lawyer from Austin, Texas, who will be speaking about, um, about uh, environmental constitutionalism and what types of, uh, what types of uh, 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 mechanisms could be put in a constitution to better uh, protect the environment over, over time. So uh, I will begin uh, by first of all speaking as an American, uh, because Scotland has never lived under a written constitution uh, uh, that's really worthy of the name, sometimes people speak about the de Declaration of Arbroath or the, uh, or for example, the Act of Union as being uh, the constitution. Now that is part of the constitution, but in the more modern day sense of a, of a constitution as being a set of rules by which the political system operates, uh, it, it, it of course the Scottish Scotland or have has lived under the Westminster system for at least since 1707. Uh, and, has, and, and the Westminster system does not have a written constitution. So I wanted to speak beginning, at the beginning as an American a little bit about what it means to have a written constitution. Now, uh, first of all, it's worthy to note that in the United States, when, for example, the, uh, the, um, the president takes the oath of office, he swears allegiance to the Constitution, not to the queen, not to a monarch, but to uh, a piece of paper and a set of rules that, that he promises to abide by and uphold during his or her uh, term of office. Uh, and as you probably have realized, Americans are very attached uh, to their constitution. And when you think of it, because the United States is composed of so many different peoples, different religions coming from all different corners of the world, the, con the constitution and the flag are one of the very few symbols which truly unite everyone. Uh, it's uh, be again because America is such a diverse population. What do all Americans hold in common? Uh, many people say, well, it means a set of values, uh, or it could be, you know, uh, it means different things to different people. But one of the again, one of very few common symbols or uh, that, that all American hold, hold in common is the, is the Constitution. And some people take, uh, you know, people take it very seriously. Not all of them are completely aware of what's in it and uh, they hold it up as, as this almost uh, venerated or sacred document uh, to some extent. You have some people that carry around little pocket-sized constitutions in their, in the, you know, uh, and then if the policeman pulls them over, they're telling the policeman that they can't search them without due process and things like that. You do have, uh, you do have people like that. But, and, and, uh, but 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 it, it truly is one of the the, the one of the main the, the political issue which both the left and the right look to as the foundation of the United States system and uh, and so the, uh, now the briefly speaking 
the it, it really is a very uh, procedural document. Uh, pro Article one sp uh, provides for the for the legislature, the House, and the Senate. Uh, you have uh, Article two provides for the presidency and gives it gives the president some relatively limited powers th that have been expanded over time. And Article three provides for the um, for the uh, for the Supreme Court and for the um, and for the uh, Congress to uh, uh, create all uh, inferior courts. Um, but a lot of, and, and, then, and then the Bill of Rights adopted in 1791 has the first 10, is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which creates the, you know, for example, the First Amendment, freedom of uh, speech, uh, press, uh, religion, uh, the establish, uh, non-established of religion and free exercise. The Second Amendment, of course, is the right to bear arms. The Third Amendment's irrelevant. It has to do with uh, housing soldiers, and that's not a not a big issue. And fourth through eighth are largely procedural, dealing with cr the rights of the accused, right to a trial, etc. So these, and and over time, they've been interpreted in very different ways. It's the foundation, but the way that the Constitution is interpreted at any one different t at any one given time really depends on the Supreme Court and how it interprets uh, and how the law uh, and the Supreme Court being the final arbiter of whether or not a law is constitutional or not. Now, this actually is not a, a, a power given in the Constitution of, in fact, a, a, a judicial review, which was which the Supreme Court practices over laws and regulations, was, not, was only given later, in fact, in uh, 180, uh, 1803 in the Marbury versus Madison case. So, and then, and then the 14th Amendment, uh, adopted after the Civil War, uh, uh, provided for equal, uh, equal protection under the law and due process, among other things. So it has been an evolving document, and it has been um, so contrary to what many originalists would say, or what they call strict constructionists, where only the, the federal government can only do the powers that are enumerated. In, in reality, it's the, the, the federal government has been gone beyond that. It's been adapted in certain ways. And that's been part of its, the reason for its success, the fact that it is somewhat malleable and able to be interpreted in different times in different ways, because if it was truly rigid, then it probably would not have survived with the broad level of acceptance and even, again, veneration. Uh, that it receives from uh, from from most uh, from most Americans, and the idea that uh, and the idea of changing it in any way, it's very difficult to amend. The amendment process is unwieldy to say the least. They they do it by tacking on amendments to the end. Uh, it's not possible to go and change the original text, uh, and that's one of I think that's one of the disadvantages right now of of the Constitution uh, is is the difficulty of amending it, and being able to straighten out some of the weaknesses which it does have. And I'll give a couple of examples that, that, uh, that have inspired me in, in what I'm trying to do here with regard to a written Scottish constitution. One example is voting rights. Voting rights are left to the states, and the states can decide the time, place, and manner of elections. And for many years, certainly, uh, and at the beginning, when, the com when the, you had the... Uh, the Constitution of 1789, you already had 13 state constitutions in effect that were adopted in 1776 and 1775, 1776 that were the state constitutions. And for example, for voting, the only elector, the only people who could vote were white male uh, landowners, basically. Everybody else was excluded. Then over time, more and of course, you had the, you know, the civil, you had the, the Civil War. Uh, freedmen were given the right to vote, but that was often denied. Uh, then wi the women's suffrage movement, women were given you know, the right to vote with the 19th Amendment uh, in, I think, 1920 when it was ratified. And there's still been these struggles over voting, voting rights that continue to this day. And that's one of the, I guess, you know, when it was understandable the way it was written at the time, if these things could be more easily changed, it could, it could much more easily provide for universal, I mean, much more universal and higher rates of citizen uh, participation. Um, I don't want to go too much into, I, there's certainly many other aspects of the U.S. Constitution I could talk about, but I did want to 
um, sort of uh, op uh, bring, uh, just bring that out as a possibility of what could be done with, uh, with a written uh, Scottish constitution. Now, ch uh, um, ch changing to the current United Kingdom arrangements, now as you probably learn in, I, don't, I, I was not educated in Great Britain, so I don't know the extent of your, the, the civics education that you receive at school, but as you probably learn, there's this notion of parliamentary supremacy. Uh, now, when, when, the, when they speak of parliament, it's not just, it's the House of Lords, the House of Commons, and the monarchy, which comprises what is called parliament. And so the idea that parliament is supreme and that nothing can bind the, the parliament and, and they can give powers and they can take them away as well. Now, this is one of the fundamental things in the United States that, would, that the Constitution does bind the government. So there are certain things under the U.S. Constitution that the government cannot do, whereas under the, the current U.K. system, uh, again, there is no, under this idea, now it goes back, of course, to you know, you know, back to the Middle Ages when there was the notion of divine right and God had chosen the king or the queen and that that person ruled by divine rule, so everything, they couldn't possibly do anything wrong, uh, etc., because everything was by divine will. Um, now, th this is, is now th this you know had played its role certainly throughout history, but now we reach a point where. Um, it's very interesting when I see the British the, the, the debate over Scottish independence, and then you read the Declaration of Independence of 1776, which you can find easily online and read. Aside from military occupation, a lot of the complaints that you see in the Declaration of Independence could be made by Scotland or Wales now today. And I think it boils down to three, um, two, three or four major issues. I think one of them is, I guess you could call it constitutional, uh, uh, ar ar you know, arbitrary constitutionalism. There's one arrangement for Northern Ireland. There's one arrangement for Wales. There's another arrangement, you know, the Welsh uh, Assembly has different powers than the Scottish Assembly. It's kind of this ad hoc way of dealing with, with different, uh, uh, and, then, and then of course they can give they can create these parliaments, for example, the Scottish Parliament or the Stormont Parliament, but they could take it away tomorrow if, if, uh, if, the, uh, if, if, the, if they decided to. If the next government says, hey, we no longer, no longer want a Scottish Parliament, they can pass legislation and get rid of it just as easily. So, I mean, and that's where the entrenched powers, uh, that, that's what I mean by entrenchment. The idea that, the, that in a constitution that these these uh, that 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 the that for example the Scottish Parliament is inviolate. It cannot be you know it cannot be removed simply by an act of Parliament, and that it has and that it has certain specified powers. Now we see this again throughout the UK currently. You have uh, you know a, a, a one of the regional devolved parliaments wants more powers. There's a commission that studies it. Parliament doesn't act. You have you know a long list of things that Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland have been asking for for years, but you know, it, it, it's very, if you're waiting for Westminster to act, you're going to be waiting for quite uh, some time. And again, just as easily as they can, they can grant these powers, they can revoke them as well. For example, the, the Parliament in Northern Ireland was abolished in 1973 at the time of the Troubles, and it was only reinstated in the late 90s after the, you know, after the Good Friday agreements. So, um, uh, so you have uh, so that you have this idea of uh, again parliamentary supremacy, the meaning that parliament cannot bind the next part. Uh, you know, a, f a previous parliament cannot uh, bind the next parliament. So uh, so essentially, the the there are no real limits on what parliament can do constitutionally in the United States. There are constitutional limits that are codified, that are relatively clear, and are in the, in the process of reinterpretation. Um, and so also with regard to codified powers that says, okay, you know, for example, the, you know, the, in the United States, the, you know, the, um, the, the, the House of Representatives has the right to raise taxes, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Senate has the right to confirm judges. Uh, the president appoints judges. You know, all of these things, you know, this person, you know, this group do, this, uh, does. In, and so this, you know, it, it's codified in a way that, that has, has, worked, uh, has worked fairly well. Whereas with the British Constitution, what does the House of Lords do? What does the, par what does the monarch do? What is the role of the monarch? It's not codified. And what I see 
in the near future uh, happening is uh, I think that the legitimacy of the monarch monarchy, I've, I've talked to several British people about this and just trying to get their read on it. And I think that the, 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 the legitimacy of the monarch is based on the premise that they remain neutral and that they don't interfere politically. Because I think if they were perceived to be interfering politically that their that their legitimacy would rapidly uh, diminish and i see and i think that queen elizabeth has done a fairly good job at at least you know uh, having the perception people feel that she does not involve in politics whether she does or not i really don't know but at the very least she you know uh, she uh, she has ma she has maintained that that uh, that that, that idea. Um, you know, we don't know with Charles what type of monarch he would be. And there's every indication that there's a, you may have read in The Guardian, they've been trying to do a Freedom of Information Act on Prince Charles to get him to see, the, to see these letters that he's written to various ministers. And they're called the Black Spider Memos, apparently, because of his writing style. And, uh, but they won't give it up. And one of the reasons that they say is we don't want people to think that he would be political because he has been. I mean, it's kind of bizarre reasoning, but that, that's, you know, you can read it. Again, The Guardian has done a lot of articles on that. But what what kind of king, what kind of king would he be? Would he be more? Uh, but there's nothing, there's nothing written down that says what exactly the role of the monarch is. You know, they have these kind of, you know, she opens parliament, she, you know, uh, you know, she uh, grants assent to laws, etc. But it's, it's not codified in a way that could avoid problems uh, down the road. Let me go, let me go ahead and go. To, so now I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the provisional constitution that came out uh, recently by, uh, the, by the Scottish government. You can certainly read it online. There's not much to it, uh, actually. And they, they say very specifically that it is a skeletal um, uh, constitution. And I think that it is, it is something that has been, is trying to be as anodyne as possible. It does not want to create any offense before a yes vote. It doesn't want to get groups mobilized against it because of what it says. So I do understand the caution on the part of the Scottish government to be as vague and anodyne as possible in this provisional constitution. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that it, it, it as a starting point, uh, it, 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 there's two, I see two fundamental flaws with it. Uh, one of them is this notion of entrenched powers. And the, and I, now they've proposed it as a bill. And apparently the way that they wish to proceed is that they have this bill, they get a yes vote. Of course, that's the, that's the key because if they don't, if Scotland does not vote yes, then they can't do anything. They're stuck with the Westminster system forever. Um, and uh, and and so the, the, the you know they but after that they will be submitting this bill to Parliament for debate during the transition period during the 18 months between the 18th of September and the the predicted date for independence in March of 2016. Now it's a bill now. You would think that a bill, that something would be a constitution, would have a higher status. But okay, if it's a bill, then it could be amended. And so these, you know, these things can, you know, the things that are in the constitution can be changed by, uh, by the, um, by the, uh, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by amendment to the uh, to the different um, uh, to the to the provisional constitution. Um, so, I, and I do, I, and so that's one of the things that needs to be reinforced during a, uh, during a period in which they would deliberate over uh, a, a constitution. I think the second part of it is the, if the, is the, um, is the notion of popular sovereignty. Now the, 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 uh, the constitution stipulates clearly that there, that the people are sovereign, uh, and yet there is still the question of the monarchy and is the monarchy consistent with popular sovereignty. And uh, that's a question that needs to be resolved. Uh, but I do see a, a problem because in the provisional constitution, they, pr they predicate it upon royal assent. And they're assuming that, 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 the, that the monarch will accede to this law, to this constitution. What if they don't? What, what if the monarch doesn't? You know, uh, how, uh, how are they going to, and, that, and that's just one of the issues that I, that needs to be addressed in this to see, well, if, you know, if, uh, if, for example, uh, Charles becomes king before 2016 and he doesn't like this constitution, can he withhold assent? 
uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, these, but these are the types of things that need to be thought about, bef uh, you know, during this process so that if there is a, uh, so that whatever comes, uh, because again, after, and after 2016, there was the plan of actually having a constitutional convention to, uh, uh, which would have broad participation to sketch out a final constitution. So again, this is all very speculative at this point, but I did see those, uh, those, um, uh, those issues as being something that should be dealt with probably before it goes to a constitutional convention. But again, if it's a bill, it can be amended by parliament during that transition uh, period. Okay, um, uh, let's see. So. Again, again, so the question of th maintaining things like royal assent uh, could be could be problematic. Now, I've uh, I don't know how this is done, but I would you know I think that it would be relevant to have a you know at, at some at, at, to have a, an elected uh, head of state. After all, if you're a Scottish government, wouldn't it be better to have a uh, you know a head of state that was Scottish? I mean, it, that's what most normal countries do have, you know, uh, so uh, th that's some, certainly some, and, and, but also with very specified codified powers. Now, uh, I suggested that, that perhaps rather than having, uh, now in the American system, the, the president has the veto power. So that, of course, if a, a bill is passed, then the president can say yes or no uh, w for no reason. He doesn't have to give any reason uh, for vetoing. Uh, but it would be interesting to have it where maybe the, the, uh, the, the head of state, whoever it is, could withhold assent only if there was a legitimate constitutional question, not whether they approved or disapproved with the policy, but whether they said, well, wait, you know, there's a problem with this, there's, you know, it, it's not, uh, then, then they could withhold assent, maybe get, you know, advice from the Supreme Court on how to make it constitutional, if there were constitutional questions, and then later, uh, uh, um, and then later um, uh, be able to uh, be able to pass it. Um, now, there's a, now, one of the, uh, I've, I've debated with my colleagues, and there's, there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of questions over how the longevity of a constitution and what a constitution should be. Now, uh, there are those who hold that it should be, uh, just to, I, I don't want to dwell too much on analogies, but is it, is it the rules of the road or is it a road map? Is it, is it something that says, well, if you come to this, you turn left or you signal or, you know, like driving a car, or is it a map that says you want to go here? You know, I mean, and uh, uh, my vision is, I think that it should, uh, I, I do think there should be rules of the road. I think that it, a constitution should, you know, constitutionally oblige a, uh, a, a Scottish Parliament to work towards certain ends, uh, like positive rights, education, health, you know, a good health system, uh, these types of things. Um, now, uh, there's dispute over whether or not these types of things should be in the Constitution because they would bind the later, uh, they, they would bind other, um, uh, 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 other, um, uh, uh, other parliaments to an unacceptable degree. Again, this is something that can be debated over time, but whether or not positive rights should be enshrined and what types and how uh, they're enshrined is, very, is obviously very important. Um, now, my, my vision also is not only just to, have, but also uh, rules of the road, but in my, vi my idea is just have to have some serious guardrails if you're going to use this, you know, road analogy. And what I've seen in the American system is where there aren't good guardrails and that, you know, that the political system can, can, can sometimes fall off the edge. And I'm thinking particularly about money in politics and the degree to which, you know, elections are, you know, uh, the, the influence of money in elections. And if there were constitutional ways that you could in, uh, that you could make sure that elections were, for example, publicly funded, that it, at low cost as possible, so that the individual representatives can spend their time actually representing their constituents rather than raising money or or you know spending time uh, doing you know uh, doing things not related to uh, to their job. Um, a lot of I know there's been a lot of talk in the in the. Um, in the and in the in the press about the role of the church in uh, in in Scotland and whether there should be a secular or a, uh, a, a religious government or what that means and I just want to 
bri- just to speak briefly about my own experience, I mean, my own experience in, in the United States, because America is, despite what you see so much, it is a very, it is a secular government. There is no established church. Now, you can say there's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, you see politicians you invoking religion often in um, in religion, in, in religious, in political discourse, but it is, uh, it is a secular government, uh, and, and there, there is no established established church. At the same time, there is freedom of religious practice; people can practice as they want. So, I think that, and and there's a difference between having a secular government, which just simply does not favor or disfavor any particular religion, and the idea of a of a of a secular society, which are two completely different things. And so, I think. That it's it's fair to uh, just point out to those who may be concerned about what a secular government means to simply say it means that it does not favor either favor or disfavor any particular religion and that it respects the, the individual right of of conscience. Um, let's see. So uh, another. Uh, idea I had that would be very interesting to adopt would be with regard to voting would be uh, automatic irre- irre- irrevocable registration for all uh, for all individuals and then uh, mandatory voting and it sounds pretty radical but uh, Australia and Belgium I believe have mandatory voting and uh, it works pretty well and you certainly don't have demonstrations in the streets demanding that they not be obliged uh, to vote. Also, the question of registration. Uh, there's a lot of people that you know maybe didn't keep didn't keep up on their records and aren't able to vote because of that. And so there's um, I think there's a case to be made for um, for uh, you know to to have uh, ma- mandatory voting. Also, anti-corruption measures, uh, the ways of again ways of keeping any information that is used in Parliament should be traceable. Their, the methodology should be traceable. It should be based on sound peer-reviewed science if it's dealing with certain areas of the environment. Um, uh, and, and this would include, in, among anti-corruption measures, would be the publicly funded, that would be, again, publicly funded campaigns. Um, and so... Uh, uh, and and uh, and so that's another element. Also, um, I I know that in the Scotland, the the Scottish Parliament currently uses the de Haunt system of proportional representation, where you have several members of a uh, of a. Um, uh, of a uh, uh, you know, have a several you have several you have different constituencies and then you have uh, several representatives from a, a group of constituencies. I think that's roughly how it how it is. And I had exchanged some e- emails with Dennis Canavan, who's the head of the Yes campaign, and he suggested the uh, what's called the single transferable vote system. This is where you have uh, you can have multi member constituencies where people uh, where people vote in preference. So you have you know your first preference, your second preference, your third preference and then depending on how it's numbered it's divided up and then they and then but you can have several members you know you can have members of different parties from the same district and it's something again it's something to consider that and uh, because from what Mr. Canavan said he didn't uh, he, he thought it was preferable to a system where you have kind of different levels of representation, whether one is more constituent-based and one is more multi-constituent based or more regional. And he felt that the, the this single transferable uh, vote system would be uh, better. Um, another would be interesting, the, there's a lot of question about whether there needs to be, a, would need to be a second chamber. And of course, you have the House of Lords in, in, in the Westminster Parliament. Uh, and at, at, at present, you have a unicameral legislature in, in, in the Scottish Parliament. And it's, and at the same time, looking at the American system, you can see how the, 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 very often the, 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 two, the two chambers do not work well together at all, and that's certainly the case uh, as we speak. But it is important to, to, that there be some kind of oversight over any chamber, and then there's some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of constitu- you know, some kind of constitutional control over it. And what I was, what I had in the idea of, um, of having a presiding officer chosen from the judiciary, that the, and the, the, the presiding officer not be part of of, you know, normally they're chosen from the ranks of the parliament. But if you had a, a presiding officer that came from the judiciary, they could play a, a role as a real arbiter, not and, and would be from outside the um, 
the 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 the, the parliament that, and that they could enforce rules both on conduct within parliament in and and be able to actually you know make make more forceful rulings but also be able to comment over the the over the writing of laws and whether or not that conforms to the constitution in france you have the conseil constitutionnel which looks over laws before they get passed and there's certainly other ideas that could be brought up but i but maybe there could be a way of not having a second chamber so that a uh, so that a, a unicamera legislature could could act effectively and not be gummed up by a second one by but was still having a good degree of control over the uh, over the um, over the legislature to make sure that they you know work you know work within uh, the constitution um all, uh, another couple, another couple ideas I had. One was on. Uh, I, I spoke to some of my uh, my friend, one of my good colleague, uh, uh, Jonas uh, pa Papadopoulos. He wanted to come to this, uh, but he couldn't. He couldn't make it uh, from uh, University of um, Macedonia. He, he's done. He's done a lot of writing on the Greek debt crisis, and he thought it would be an interesting idea if there were some at the, in his Scottish constitution, if there were some uh, financial uh, regulation. Uh, issues, and he suggested, for example, including a an, uh, 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 an equivalent of the Glass-Steagall Act in a constitution, which pr would prevent the, uh, the you know which would separate investment banking from uh, commercial banking in a constitution. It's an idea whether uh, uh, and so that that, that could have maybe helped uh, you know minimize or mitigate the the uh, uh, the the um, financial crash of a few years ago if such a thing had been in place uh, in the UK and was revoked in the US. Also, the the ability of the, the giving the power of the Scottish Parliament to regulate the amount of leverage that a uh, that a bank can use in financial transactions, uh, you know, it, it could be limited. You know, that could be determined by law. It might change over time depending on it. But you know, certain key powers that 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 could be given to the Scottish Parliament to regulate things that are, you know you know, that, that are very important and should not, and uh, Brent's going to talk in a few minutes more about, um, uh, about it with regard to uh, environmental regulations, but things which should, should be able to be regulated, should be able to be so that they don't fall completely out of control. That's what I meant by guardrails. You know, the idea that you have the roads that you can go on, but you need to make sure that they don't fall off a cliff and that there be these constitutional mechanisms to keep the political system and the economy, for that matter, on the road. Um, uh, f f a couple more, and then I'll uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll I'll yield the floor to Nicola. Um, I was also uh, considering the the idea of having a coherent law, uh, a corpus of laws and treaties. Uh, now, of course, uh, the the current Scottish law is a mixture of Westminster law, European law, um, uh, Scottish law. Of course, it, it comes from uh, numerous sources. And what would be uh, interesting to do would be to Re, is 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 to recodify the law into a single unitary corpus of text, a corpus of laws that anybody can consult, written in a clear, incomprehensible language, uh, and that that again that anybody can uh, understand, because uh, the law should be for people to follow, not to be so opaque that people don't know when they're breaking the law and it being used against them in that way. Uh, and the same with treaties, where you have a corpus of treaties that that the Scottish government is. Bound to respect at any given time. For example, of course, the EU treaties uh, and the um, and uh, and maybe you know the the World Trade Organization or you know these other ones to to which Scotland becomes signatory. Uh, but but maintain it. Uh, I think that I, I remember when a few a couple years ago there was a report that came out from the from Whitehall saying that the that the um, that the Scottish government, that the the UK was currently signatory to fourteen thousand different treaties, and that the Scotland would be needed to renegotiate all fourteen thousand. Never mind that some of them are from the colonial era. So, but anyway, that but but just have a a corpus of treaties that the Scottish government is bound to respect at that given time. But when they become obsolete or outdated, they're able to be removed from this corpus so that it can maintain its coherence and uh, and integrity. Um, so uh, these are the ideas, and again, I've, I've just, uh, for those watching, I've uh, put this on the Newsnet Scotland website, and you can see if you go there, there's an uh, item, uh, a modern, uh, a 
Constitution for a Modern Scotland, you can click on that and have a look at the text that I've come up with that I've that's been evolved from several different uh, preceding texts. But I just wanted to, to, as speaking to the people who may be watching this, uh, I think that this is an important time for you to become involved and uh, learn as much as you can about constitutions, how they work, and uh, participate. And if, if there is a yes vote, to contact your representatives, to give them suggestions. What, what, what would you like in a constitution? What do you think would be uh, appropriate? Uh, and contribute to the discussion, because this truly is a, a historic opportunity for a, a country who may become independence, not out of war, out of a legal vote, uh, in a peaceful society, and in a political context in which you can truly build something new that is um is uh is you know it will uh, you know will be it can, could be effective well into the future but it needs to be wired correctly it's like you're wiring a house or plumbing a house if you you if you have weak links in it it can burst and you know uh and and so it it's it's important to do right and to get but again uh i encourage i encourage any you know everybody who is is interested in seeing uh, if Scotland does become independent, to, constr to construct a, a constitution and, uh, again, become as informed as you can, uh, contact your representatives and let them know how you feel uh, about it and what you would like and have your, have your voice heard. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we'll have uh, Nicolas Levra and then uh, Mr. Uh, uh,